I will um, finish what I started on the analysis of trusses, right? Okay. Right. Now I said last time, right? that there are two main methods to analyze these trusses, right? Okay? Right. So, we started the lecture on trusses by looking at the stability of the truss. In other words, is this actually a structure or a truss or is it a mechanism? Uh, will it collapse or not, right? So, we came up with some mathematical formulas <coughs> and we discovered that the mathematical formula is enough to show that the truss is unstable, right? if m provided is less than m required it is unstable, but just because m provided is equal to m required or m provided even is greater than m required, you know it does not mean it is stable, you have to look and see whether it is stable or not. And then uh, you know if, if m provided is equal to the m required it is determinate, if it is greater then it is indeterminate, right. So, the bit about indeterminate I will have a look at today also, but then we looked at the ways of analyzing trusses and we started with the method of joints, go to each joint in turn and write two equilibrium equations, right. <coughs> so, I will start on this page, this is the last page I gave you, not this one. Right, okay. So, on the top of this page, I have said that there are some joints that have some special features, right. I asked you to study that by yourself and I will examine you out of the 20 questions. I mean there is a 70 percent chance that at least one question will be on this, right. But I will not teach you, right. So, you can either talk to your friends about it or you refer some kind of resource, right. What is special about these kinds of joints? What do we know about the forces in the members at these kinds of arrangements, right, okay. Then this is what we are coming to right at the bottom of that page which you do not have right now, I mean I gave it to you last time. This is the second main method of analyzing trusses, this is called the method of sections, right. First is the method of joints and this one is the method of sections, right. Now, the principle here, the rule here or the idea here is that if the entire truss is in equilibrium, which it is when you are asked to analyze it then every part of the truss also must be in equilibrium. We said last time that if the entire truss is in equilibrium, every joint must be in equilibrium. Here we are saying that every part of it must be in equilibrium. And we know about parts because we have cut structures before, imaginary cuts. For example, to expose the bending moment and shear force, we cut the beam. Then the internal forces become visible, become external forces, right. So, here also we can, okay, here we are the method, cut the truss across the members and the number of members that you cut must be less than or equal to 3, right, whose forces are required. The internal forces in the cut members will become external forces for part of the truss. These can be represented as tensile forces. Normally, we represent everything as tensile forces. Find the forces using up to three equations of equilibrium that is vertical, horizontal and moment equilibrium, right. So, it is like this. So, this is a truss. Now, let us say this is especially useful when you want to know the forces in a selected set of members. Now, last time that truss I gave as an example, we started at one joint and we went to all the joints. Now, imagine if a truss is very, very large, right. And
and by the time I finish the lecture today, you will have some idea about where the largest forces in a truss are going to be. I mean, I gave you some, uh, you, know, you, you know, towards the end of the lecture, you know, I, that, 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 that truss, I, thought, I, I told you it looked like a cantilever and the members that are close to the supports, they had higher forces. So, like that you can guess, right? Okay. So, if you guess where the largest forces are going to be and you want to have an idea about what those largest forces are, then you can cut those members, right? So, in this case, let us say that, uh, you know, this is like a similar truss to the one that we looked at. It is supported here on rollers here, not identical, but similar, loaded here, here and here. And let us say that you want the forces in these three members, right? then we cut this right now in general when you do this when you do this cutting you have to make sure that you cut only three members you can cut two or one well, you generally won't be able to cut one because when you're cutting it you'll have to cut through two i mean if you take a cut here then you can find the forces in this member and this member but those are not the forces we want these are the forces we have been asked to find then you cut these three members right now, you can take a cut like this also. You can cut this member, this member, this member and this member, right? A different set of members, right? right? Now, if you cut those four members, then you will not be able to use this method because you are cutting more than three members. Then you will have four unknown forces and with three equations of equilibrium, you cannot find four unknown forces, right? So, this method has to be used cutting three members at a time, right? not more than three members at a time. Now, when you cut it, once again, you can consider the equilibrium either of the left hand side or the right hand side, right? Left hand part or the right hand part, right? Now, here also, we can completely ignore whatever forces are here. So, we can find the forces in these members by this method without knowing, for example, the support reactions even by just considering the left hand part of this structure, right? Now, when you cut it, then you have to mark these internal forces, that is the axial forces, you have to mark it and we are marking it as tension. That means pulling on that joint, pulling on that joint, pulling on that joint, right? Now, the effect of all of these supports and things like that is automatically accommodated by, you know, this equilibrium diagram, right? Now, we are completely ignoring P3 also, we do not need it, right? So, you might ask how is this supported? We are not interested, right? It is supported through these internal forces here. They will be balancing these external loads, right? And we can now write three equilibrium equations, right? I think I may have written those also here. Right now here, we are just producing this line just to indicate that this force and this force will meet at that point because the members will meet at that point. The force along that member also will meet at that point. We make use of that property. Right? Okay. Right. Okay. Right. So, what do we do? We can take FBD by taking moments about E. Yeah, that is why we need that point. We take moments about E. The moment we take moments about E, moment due to this one and moment due to this one will vanish because they pass through E. Right? So, the moment due to FBD is FBD times that distance that is in the clockwise direction that is balanced by P2 into that distance plus P1 into that distance. We can immediately find FBD, right? We can find FCE by taking moments. Now, you might be able to guess. Anybody guess taking moments about? FCE we can find by taking moments about where? Yeah? B, correct, right? We take moments about B because if you take moments about B, moment due to this force vanishes, moment due to that force vanishes because they are passing through B. In fact, moment due to this one also vanishes, right? Very easy. So, F C E times that distance, in this case plus, because in same direction, plus P 1 times that distance equals 0, right? So, you will be able to guess that F C E will in fact be a compressive force because you get a negative answer for F C E, right? But I am not doing the problem here, I am just outlining the method, right? Then the easiest way to find these inclined members is to take a vertical equilibrium, right? In this case, if you take vertical equilibrium, this force and this force 
we do not have a vertical component. So, this one times sin of this angle in the downward direction plus p 1 plus p 2 equals 0 right. So, probably f b e will also be a compressive force right it will probably be negative right. Now, I will work out an example which illustrates all of this, but this is the method right. So, provided you are cutting three members then it is quite easy right. You do not have to find. So, we do not know the force here and 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 the force there, but if we do not need those and we need only some especially the forces in the middle of the truss then this is a very well very useful method right ok. When is it useful to use the method of joints and when is it useful to use the method of section. So, that also I have not answered maybe you can think about it maybe I might ask it at the exam right. Now, towards the end I am trying to get you to think about things for yourself right ok. When should you use the method of joints and when should you use the method of sections right those are the two main methods right ok. So, now we go into this example right this is the picture right. So, I will use this to show the calculations and like last time I will draw this here. So, this is A, B, then C I come down here, D, E that is the way it is drawn, F, G, H, I, J, K. And here this will be L. So, that is on rollers that means no horizontal forces. So, that is a support reaction at L and this is the support reaction at A right. So, there can be a horizontal force here there can be a horizontal force, but because there are no horizontal forces on the structure that horizontal force will be 0 right. So, we have just 1 kilo Newton loads here right. Then we have 3 5 kilo Newtons here right ok. So, this is uh, 5 meters times 6 base this is 30 meters this is uh, 8 meters right. So, this one will be 15 and this rise ok. So, if you want I mean maybe you can write down. So, the span equals 30 meters that means it is spanning a distance of 30 meters quite a large span that is about 90 feet right 90 feet ok and uh, the rise that is the other word that is used the, the truss rises 8 meters right the rise is 8 meters ok. So, uh, now as before we will maybe you do not need it 
Yeah, I think you do need it, right. We find the external reactions, right. We find the external reactions. I think you will need the external reactions. Anyway, good to get practice to find the external reactions. So, for the entire truss you take moments about A. So, if you take moments about A. So, R L into 30 will be the only anti-clockwise moment. Everything else will be a clockwise moment, right. So, that is 5 times 5 plus 5 times 10 plus 5 times 15 plus 1 times 5 plus 1 times 10 plus 1 times 15, 1 times 20, 1 times 25, right. Everything else is a clockwise direction. So, we can find R L, right. That is what I have done. R L we obtain as 7.5 kilo newtons, right. Then, we can take moments about L and find R A or we can just resolve vertically R A plus R L equals 5 plus 5 plus 5 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, plus 1 right. So, normally now I told you about idealization right? when we analyze these trusses now the truss itself has a load right. So, the truss load also is divided into the loads that are coming at that point. Right, the trust, I mean that is what it is done. At the moment, you do not need that, but if you are actually thinking about analyzing a truss, then the load of the truss is also distributed among all the joints like this, right. Otherwise, you might wonder what is happening to the load of the truss, right. So, this is not only the loads that are coming on it, and I like I also said, if you have a load somewhere in between, part of the load is taken there, part of the load is taken there, right. So, at the end of the day, this is the problem that you have to solve, right, okay. Now, we, we get R A equals 12.5. Now, once again I said you know when you get sort of these solutions, intermediate solutions, you check whether it is reasonable, right. So, you look at this truss, geometrically it is symmetrical, meaning if you put a mirror here, you can look inside the mirror and everything that you see here, you can see inside the mirror, and this will be reflected onto that side, geometrically. But load wise it is not symmetrical, the top is symmetrical the bottom is more heavily loaded onto this side. So, you would expect this support reaction to be greater than this one, which is exactly what we have got. So, well, maybe we have not made a gross error, we have not made a big error, right, okay. So, that is the first thing. Now, I think this is, this is say, yeah, find the forces in members F G, G H and G A, G I. F G, Uh, yeah, the, you know, FH, FH, GH and GI these, right. So, you, you then have to cut this, right. And when you cut it, now we are, so if you look here, now on this right hand side, we do not have any of these forces, right. So, it is better to examine this right hand side. In both sides of course, you will get a support reaction, but here you have only in addition to this support reaction, we have only two external forces, right. So, one known support reaction, two known loads and three unknown forces, better to stick to the right hand side, okay, right. So, as now of course, you might have to find these angles, I do not know when I have done that, when this worked example. It, in fact, I have done that at the start, right, ok. Here now, here we have something here. Now, this span, this is half the span that is 15, this rise is 8. So, you can see that that forms sort of a part of a Pythagoras triangle, right, uh, sort of 3, 4 and 5 are components of a Pythagoras triangle, right. Uh, what are the other ones? Commonly known ones. Well, anyway, 15, 8 and 17 also you should be able to recognize that, right, ok. Ok, otherwise you, you will be able to, you, you can find this, the square root of 8 square plus 15 square, right. Ok, so then you can find sin theta and cos theta, right. You will need these in these equations, right. So, later on we will need this beta also, but I think we will do that when we come to it, right, ok. So, we will start now. So, you take moments about g. Now, when we take moments about g, uh, 
these the moments due to these two forces vanish. So the, in, for this one, uh, so this 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 distance between now now it's not this distance. It's just a dropper perpendicular there, right? So the perpendicular there will be fifteen times. Tan theta, yeah, okay, right. And everything moves about G. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, okay. So so this is this is sine theta, right? This divided by that. Okay, right. So this distance is fifteen sine theta. So, F F H into 15 sin theta will give an anti-clockwise moment, R L times 15 also will give an anti-clockwise moment, 1 times 5 and 1 times 10 will give clockwise moments, which is what you have here, 1 times 5 plus 1 times 10 minus R L times 15 etcetera, right. So, sin theta we can find from this and therefore, we can find F F H, we have marked this as a tensile force that is we are pulling on this joint. Remember this is the part of the structure that we are looking at this joint, this joint, this joint, this joint and that joint and there are now external forces on those joints because the structure is cut there right. So, if F F H although it is marked as tension we obtained as a compressor compressive force right ok. Now, you take moments about H. So, if you take moments about H, moments due to these two forces vanish, moment due to this one also vanishes. So, it is just F G i into that distance. What is that distance? It is uh, the tan theta, no? Uh, 10 times tan theta, F G i into 10 tan theta. Uh, uh, plus 1 into 5, because that will also be a clockwise moment, R L times 10, we are taking moments about that now, will be an anti clockwise moment, right. So, R L times 10 is a negative 1, the other two are positive and we will find that F G i is in fact a tension, tensile force, right. So, F G i is tension, right, this one is tension, ok. Now, like I said the easiest thing to do here is to take vertical equilibrium. So, this will be F G H cos beta, right, cos beta, this will be F F H uh, sin theta, right, sin theta, right. So, you have a cos beta and sin theta term, right, you can figure it out for yourself. Now, cos beta we have not found, but if you think about beta, now this distance is 5, this beta, that distance is 5 and this one is 10 tan theta, 10 tan theta, right. So, we know theta. So, this is 10 tan theta. So, we will obtain beta as this angle, right. So, then you can find what uh, what cos beta is, right. And you get that this F G H is minus 1.369, right. So, now the thing to observe as I have written down here. Of course, last time I wrote down these forces right along the truss and I asked you to see whether there is any pattern. Now, I cannot do that because I have found only three forces, but anyway let us write it down. So, there we are F F H is minus 13.81 that is minus thirteen point eight one. F G i is 13.13, so that is plus and uh, what is the other one? F G h is minus 1.37, I will just say minus 1.37, right. So, in terms of a pattern, in terms of a pattern, you, if you sort of do the other ones, I mean you can go home and 
for practice you can solve this by the method of joints also. That's what I say, you know, you can sort of use all these examples to give yourself some practice, right. I am not going to ask you to do it, you can do it yourself. You can check whether you get the same answers by the method of joints, right. And you can also find the other forces, right. And you will see all the top forces are negative, they are all compressive. And all the bottom forces, the bottom chord forces are plus, they are tension. And here you get them varying between tension and compression. In the middle here you will tend to get small forces, I will explain why, right. Next, but for the moment, now the last time we looked at uh, that example, it was something like this, it was uh, supported on this side and loaded here and it looked like a cantilever. But this one now is looking like a simply supported beam, right. It is very different to a beam because it is sort of pointed and things like that, right. But it is supported at the two ends and the loads are inside, right. So, if it is bending like this, you can see that this face is getting stretched. So, that is tension and this one we get compressed and that is compression. So, all the top in these simply supported trusses, right, all the top will be compression and all the bottom will be tension. These web members in the middle, they have fairly small forces, right? Okay. So, so that's the next method. Uh, like and like I said, if you want only to find the forces in certain members, uh, then this is a good method, right? So, uh, are there any questions about this? So, these are the two main methods. Even about the previous one, if you have a question. Okay. Is everybody happy? Are you okay? You have a question? No? How about you? You okay? Okay, no one is asking questions, right. Okay, right. Yeah. We keep it somewhere in the middle and it will be you, helpful for everyone. Yeah, yeah, you have a question. In the middle, the top and the bottom chord tend to have high forces. I will explain why, right. The webs of course have small forces and where the webs are concerned towards the end, they have high forces, right. So, you will soon see why, see why, right. But before I do that, every time when I come to this part in my lecture, right, uh, now you might think that this is a bit of an odd thing to say, right. But when I look around the class, all the boys are still wearing covered shoes or should I call you gentlemen, gentlemen, right. All the gentlemen are still wearing covered shoes, right. Now, when I go to lecture in semester 3 and semester 2 and all, they are all wearing sandals, right. The ladies somehow are wearing uh, sort of what do you call it, uh, yeah, open sandals. Now, why, why are the boys wearing covered shoes? Normally, people tell me because your seniors ask you to wear covered shoes, is that right? Is that the reason? Okay, right. Okay, so that is part of the rag or what it is, right. Anyway, I have told you not to worry about what other people tell you and to have your own mind whether you want to do that or not is different, but it helps my example, right. Right. So, now there are two reasons why shoes are used, right. Okay. What are the two reasons? Anyone knows? You know why, why you, you do not know why you wear shoes, right. Okay. Right. What about, why, are, why are shoes used? Right. Yeah. Protect to protect, okay, to protect, right. Okay. So, let me say, shoes are used to keep your feet clean, which is probably the only reason why it is used in our kinds of countries, close to the equator. But if later on you go to England or Australia or the US or Canada to study, then you will realize that shoes are used to keep your feet warm also in the winter, right. Now, you are being asked to use cover, use covered shoes because it is seen as part of a dress code that is forced on you, 
right now if you now the ladies are also wearing slippers and things like that right now if you only needed to keep your feet clean all you need to do is to have something underneath your foot right only a sort of like you know the sole of the shoe sometimes it's called a sole but you can't manage with only the sole of the shoe because if you have only the sole of the shoe when you lift your foot then the shoe will be on the ground and your foot will be in the air you have to hold the sole of the shoe to the top of your leg or foot sorry right so when people make sandals what do they do actually they cut away all the unessential parts of the shoe right the parts of the shoe that are not required for stability if you want are removed right so you can think of a truss especially this kind of truss because this kind of truss helps us to illustrate that this is sometimes called a parallel corded truss or an open web gird i think i have used those words somewhere right okay so this you can see as a beam right so imagine a beam which is fairly uh, deep right going from here to here all the non essential parts of the beam has been removed if you manage with this parts of the beam then you can carry load you can carry load right now if we use that as an analogy we can make a quick calculation without even going to methods of sections and method of joints and things like that a quick calculation as to what the maximum forces in this kind of truss is going to be right okay so how do we do that so this is called using a beam analogy right analogy is that in something that you are comparing right okay right so this is especially useful for what are called open web girders like that you know it's like the web that that middle part is called the web in fact i said that sometimes these are called cord members and these are called web members right so sometimes in a beam right if you have a beam like this right then of course the terms are slightly different so this is called a flange and this inside thing is called a web that those are the words right so if you look at this in longitudinal section it will look like this and here of course you have a solid web but then you can go and sort of cut out pieces in the web like that not everything but some parts in others you can convert it to something like this right an open web girder right so uh now if we are able to convert this loading and pretend that it is a uniformly distributed load and for many of these structures the load does not change from one point of the truss to another so you can see even in this one this is one 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 here of course it was a bit different right okay uh, but that's because more because uh, maybe we had to give you a problem to solve right so so normally these are generally uniformly loaded like this right and if they if they are uniformly loaded then we can treat this as a beam and in a beam of course we are used to finding bending moments and shear forces right so in a simply supported beam maximum bending moment will be at the center and if you remember it will be wl squared divided by 8 right now the maximum shear force will be equal to the support reactions and that will be wl divided by 2 right so those are the bending moments and shear forces that have to be resisted not by this beam but by this truss now a truss of course uh, like i said has a yeah, truss is a collection of individual uh, tension and compression elements right so how we how we assess or how we guess the forces in the truss is like this we say that if there is a maximum bending moment here it's sort of like taking a method of sections right the force here and the force here will act as a couple to resist that bending moment one force will be in one direction because it is compression the other force will be in the other direction because it is in tension right so that will be acting as a couple and when we go here uh you know there will be some kind of reaction here 
and that reaction will be resisted by the vertical component of this one. So, of course, this one will directly resist it in this case right and then the vertical component of this will be whatever force here times uh, this cos theta or whatever right. So, now if you look at this example, we assume that the bending moment is carried by the cord members times the truss depth and the shear force is carried by the vertical component of the web member force right. So, for this example, now we are saying that each, so this is like uniformly loaded. So, each joint has 1 kilo Newton that is because that corresponds to all the load going from here to here right is applied at the midpoint. All the load from there to there is applied at the midpoint. So, where this joint is concerned only half that sort of uh, uh, half that distance is available. So, we put half a kilo Newton there. So, if you add up all of these you will get 8 this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 plus half plus half right. So, then the uniformly distributed load now it so happens that this is 8 meters also. So, 8 kilo newtons divided by 8 meters would be 1 kilo newton per meter. So, the uh, maximum bending moment at the center here will be W L squared by 8 that means 1 into 8 squared divided by 8 that means 8 kilo newton right. So, this force or this force times this distance will be equal to 8 kilo newton meters right. So, the maximum force in a cord right these are the cords top or bottom cord right. So, we are not interested now in the because this is an approximate calculation right. So, the top will be in compression bottom will be in tension right ok. But this is just sometimes it is called sometimes in engineering we call this you should, you should get to know this language also back of the envelope calculations right. Now, of course, we can do it on smartphones and we do not need envelopes right, but those days you know on the site itself you know somebody had to make a quick calculation and you know so because on the smartphone is a calculator also, but earlier no calculator. So, you just take the envelope and behind the some old envelope you take behind the envelope you can make a small calculation and do just an approximate approximate calculation right. But that word is now <laughs> part of the engineering engineering uh, sort of you know story or whatever it is right back of the envelope calculation. So, this beam analogy beam analogy is good for a back of the envelope calculation right. So, we know ok the cord members have to be such that they have to be able to resist 8 kilo newtons. Now, how about the web members? Now, you go here now this angle is 45 degrees. So, whether it is sin of course, it is the same. So, the so the the maximum shear that has to be resisted is W by divided by 2 that is 4 kilo newtons right. So, the maximum force in the web now sometimes you have this truss like this in fact, I have asked it there also right and sometimes you have it like this right. Sometimes you have it like this sometimes you have it like that ok. Uh, uh, so, so, whichever way you have it because this is just an approximate calculation. So, the maximum force in the web times sin 45 that will be the vertical component should be equal to 4 and therefore, the maximum force in the web will be 4 times square root of 2 right. So, you can actually now once again you can go home and use the method of sections and find out whether you actually get this right. And for this one you can maybe use the method of joints and see whether you actually get it because this is close to the support here. No? So, you can easily use the method of joints right. You might find that it varies a bit right, but roughly speaking it is there and generally speaking it is a safe solution right. Meaning that most probably this will be more than what you require right. Most probably it will be more than what you require it is just a quick calculation ok. But you need to have an idea that a you need to have the idea that a truss can be viewed as a beam and when you see it as a beam then the bending moment is resisted by the cords and the shear force is resisted by the webs right. Now, if you go back to our beam and the bending moment and shear force diagrams right. So, that is a so this is the shear force diagram right. So, maximum shear force at the two ends 
and this is the bending moment diagram, right? Zero bending moment at these two, right? So that means these forces are going to be quite small. This force and this force, right? This force is going to be quite large because the shear force is large. But this force probably will be zero. You can check it out, right? That is because the shear force here is zero, right? That is why earlier also, right? Even in something that did not look like a parallel corded truss at all, this web member force towards the center of the truss is quite small, certainly compared to this one and this one, right. If you find this web member force, it will be much larger, right. You can check it out, you can check it out, okay, right. So, you uh, have to see a truss as being something like a beam something like a beam, right? Okay. Now, there are two other sections that have to be covered. Uh, I mean, these are examinable of course, right? All things are examinable that I cover other than maybe that thing about uh, Ramanujan sum to infinity. I will not ask you a question on that, right? Okay. Uh, but uh, this one, you know, I have been talking a lot, especially uh, well, even earlier, but especially last lecture about this thing about um, uh, you know stable and indeterminate, right? So I said you cannot use the laws of statics alone, right? Uh, so 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 maybe this is slightly beyond <laughs> maybe your semester, but you need to have some idea about how how to solve problems like that. So, this is a very simple and gentle introduction to indeterminate structures, which of course form the majority of structures that we see, right. The majority of structures are indeterminate structures, right. So, this is how you go around solving them. Most of the structures that you see in the real world, the indeterminate ones, they are all solved by computer, but of course, you need to know the basic principles, right. So, if a truss is indeterminate, that is, it has more members than required for equilibrium. The equilibrium equations alone will not be sufficient to find the unknowns. One or more what are called compatibility equations relating to truss deformations must be used, right. So, I will directly use an example to do this. Find the member forces in this open truss, okay. Now, this is an open truss that you can see here. This truss is directly connected to the ground. I told you that you know the basic building block of an open truss or even a closed truss is a triangle and all you need is one free joint and two members m equals 2j is the equation. But here we have gone and put another member which is also connected directly to the ground. So, we have m, so j equals 1, right. So, the m, m, the number of members we have is 3, it is greater than 2j, right. So, sometimes we say that this is the degree of redundancy, right. Degree of redundancy is 3 minus 2 equals 1. So, um, now, if you think about it, uh, uh, let us try to write equations of equilibrium, right. Now, in this case, of course, I have uh, slightly violated my uh, sign convention and use the forces as compressive, right, okay. So, you please excuse me for that. Of course, in one sense, I will not make any uh, apologies for that because you have to be able to switch between sign conventions. For this problem, compression is positive because we can look at the problem and see that everything is compressive, right. We can close our eyes and see that if you have a load here and it is supported by three, three members there, then everything is going to be in compression, right. So, I have marked it in such as such f 1, f 2 and f 3. So, let us take an equilibrium equation there, right. So, vertical equilibrium f 1 cos 30. So, that is this is f 1, right. You can have both, you can see both on your screen uh, plus f 2 that is in the vertical direction plus f 3 cos 30 equals w, right. So, if we substitute for cos 30, we get this. And if you take horizontal equilibrium at this point, you get that f 1 sin 30 equals f 3 sin 30. Where we, from this, you just get that f 1 equals f 3 from that equation. So, that is all the horizontal equilibrium equation gives you, right. So, instead of f 3, we can write f 1, 
right? But those are the only two equations that you have, right? Because uh, you know you cannot write a moment equilibrium or whatever it is. This is basically the method of joints, right? At every joint, you can write two equations, right? So, so, so we have one equation that tells us that f1 equals f3, but the other one, of course, which has f1 and f2 and f3 in it, right? So three unknowns, only two equations. So we cannot solve it, right? Now, how do we solve it? We try to see what happens when this truss deforms. Now, we have never considered that before. We have only thought about the equilibrium of the truss. Now, we see when this truss deforms, in other words, it's not going to deform by very much, but only a small amount, but we magnify that, right? We magnify it. We, we, otherwise, we cannot draw it here, right? So, when it deforms like that, you know, all of these three members will still be connected to this joint J, right? So, that is obvious, right? And because of equilibrium, because of symmetry, it will deform downwards like this. So, this member, this, this, this member will come and it will be this length. And if you think about this member, you can see that that member will, because this is all hinges here, this will swing over here. So, this member we assume that position and this member will assume that position, right? Now, when you draw an arc like that, it is 90 degrees there, 90 degrees there also, right? So, so, so we, 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 we think about this point here and that is 90 degrees. So, we can draw just this bit because this triangle here, these two triangles there, they give you the deformation of the members from the initial state to the final state, okay? So, E1, E2 and E3 are the deformations, right? Now, we have never required deformations before to find forces, but now we need deformations. That is the thing, right? That is that's, that, that's what happens when you have indeterminate structures, right? Okay, now we have to go to Hooke's law, right? So, by Hooke's law, stress equals strain, right? So, stress is force divided by area, right? Now, here the areas also I have changed just to make it a little more interesting. So, this is A, this is A and the central one is 2A, right? So, if you apply it for each one of these deformations, so E in general, maybe I have not written that out, maybe I can write it, uh, erase this. Right? So, E in general will be equal to F, which is what we had to find, times the corresponding length of the member divided by the cross section of the member divided by E. Now, Young's modulus we assume is the same for everything, but the A will change, right? So, for the member number 1, this will be F1 L1 divided by A E. For member number 2, instead of A, we put 2 A there. For member number 3, we continue to put A there, right? Now, this is actually the compatibility equation. This is the important equation, right? So, E1 cos 30, no, sorry, E1 divided by cos 30, right? Uh, well, so, so, you could actually say that uh, uh, E 1 divided by E 2 is in fact cos 30, E 1 divided by E 2 is cos 30. So, that is why I have written here. They deform in a way that E 1 divided by E 2 will have to remain as cos 30, right? That is the way it deforms, okay? So, now we can write this E 1, uh, we can continue to expand this out. So, for L 1, what is L 1 here? L1 is that length, right? So, if this is h, that is h divided by cos 30, that will give you that inclined length, right? So, L1 is h divided, so F1, L1 is h divided by cos 30, this remains A E, right? Now, this is the equilibrium equation, you divide this entire thing by cos 30, E1 you divide by cos 30, that is equal to E2, 
which is equal to f 2 into h. Now, here this length is h, right. The length here was h divided by cos 30, but here the length is h, right, and divided of course by 2 a e, right. So, here we have in fact a third equation. It is a relationship between f 1 and f 2, which we have got by finding a relationship between e 1 and e 2. So, that in other, in other words, for this deformation to be compatible, right, in order for the structure to remain as a single entity, E1 divided by E2 must be equal to cos 30, right. So, that is a compatibility of deformations. From E1 we can go to, from E, from the E's we can go to the F's by using Hooke's law, right. So, now we have a completely new equation between F1 and F2 which we can use in combination with these two. Then we have three equations and three unknowns, right. So, F2 is equal to this and if you simplify all of this out, F2 will be equal to F1 multiplied by 8 over 3. In other words, that is 2.67 F1, right. So, now we can go to this equation 1. This is 2.67 F1. This one is uh, f 1 into root 2 divided by 3. This one also we can write as f 1 into root 3 divided by 2 by using this uh, sort of symmetry condition right here we are and that is equal to w and this one we give that f 1 is equal to 0.227 whereas f 2 is equal to 0 0.606 and f 3 will be equal to f 1 right. So, just to give you a, a glimpse into what will happen if you have an indeterminate structure, right. In addition to the equilibrium equations, you have to use what is called a compatibility equation, right. So, here we needed to use only one compatibility equation because uh, the degree of redundancy was just one, right. If there are more degrees of redundancy, then we will have to use more compatibility equations, right, okay. A a any questions about that? So, this is a very important concept, right. So, in addition to equilibrium, we look at compatibility also. Regarding this one, yes. Uh, at the same, we are considering that uh, the force of this member yeah. is equal to the maximum yeah, yeah. shear force. Yeah, yeah. Shouldn't it? That the force, if you use the method of joints or whatever it is, you will find that the force here is uh, generally much less then what you get here, right. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you use this one, you will find, uh, well I am not exactly sure what will happen, right. But uh, we, 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 we do not do it like that, we do not say this plus this. In fact, first of all this entire shear force will be taken by this, right. Okay, so, this will in fact have, because if you think about the method of joints and apply an equilibrium equation here, this will also be actually in compression, this will be uh, W A by 2, right. Think about writing an equi equ equilibrium equation here for this joint, because if you take vertical equilibrium, this may not uh, join. So, W A by 2 will be equal to uh, uh, this one here, right. Then, because of this force, the uh, uh, and this force that you have here, you know the, the force that you get here will be a little less, right. So, it is not easy to say like that, right. But generally speaking, we just take that whatever, uh, whatever uh, web member you have at the end, you take the vertical component of the force in that web member and make it equal to the maximum shear, right. So, you cannot go wrong in that right okay so like i said you 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 will you will get a number less than this you will get a number less than this but you will not get a number that is you know half of this right it's not like as if this and this are combining to carry this w a by 2 it's nothing near near that right it will be a little less than that right i think if i if i if i'm not mistaken you will get 3.5 times square root of 2 right you can check it out probably you will get 
times square root of 2. Okay. Second question is this particular uh, diagram, no? how do I get this relationship between E 1 and E 2, right. Okay. So, I take this arc, I assume that this arc is at 90 degrees to this line, right. So, it is, it is at 90 degrees to this line also, right. So, therefore, actually there is a little bit of error there because there may be some finite angle here, no, right. But the most definite thing that we can say is it will be 90 degrees to this point, right. So, although the arc will fall somewhere here a little bit below that point perhaps, you know it is, uh, it is reasonable to assume that you can draw uh, a perpendicular line here and assume that that is E 2, that, that is uh, enough, that degree of accuracy is sufficient, okay. Is, is that what you are asking? Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. is the uh, v, v is the normal okay thank you for the asking that question in uh, uh, in section c5 once again the beam analogy the symbol capital v right is sometimes used for shear force right maybe i have not used that before right i think earlier i would have just used uh, s no i would have used s right so it's just like saying s max right v max right uh, later on. So, I do not know why V is used for shear force, but uh, maybe it just stands for vertical, I do not know why, but uh, it is a commonly used symbol for shear force. M of course, is used for bending moment, right. Okay. Right. Now, we come to the last sheet, actually which is a <laughs> section I introduced for you all, right. I had not introduced it before. While doing that, uh, I will now pass out, uh, you know, uh, this thing that you had to fill up. Do not do this now, but I will do it so that you do not waste your time, right. Uh, I do not waste your time at least, right. Uh, so, so, keep this with you because you have to uh, <laughs> evaluate your teacher, right. You have to evaluate your teacher. Uh, I think I told you, I do not know whether it was in this group, uh, somebody came and did the peer observation for me. We had to get ourselves observed by a colleague and we had to get ourselves uh, <laughs> evaluated by our students, right. Okay, so, that is the sort of quality assurance procedure that the university adopts, right, okay. I do not know how uh, clear this is unfortunately, right, maybe it is not very clear. So, you might have to follow it, uh, follow it. Uh, So, here I am going from two dimensional trusses to three dimensional trusses, right. Now, we did that earlier also with respect to stability, but now we are looking at analysis. In other words, how to find the internal forces, right. So, what I just did a little while ago was how do I move from two dimensional determinate trusses to two dimensional indeterminate trusses, right. So, most of the time you will be thinking about two dimensional determinate trusses, two main methods of analysis, method of joints and method of uh, sections, right. That should be able to cover maybe 80, 90 percent, well, of, of what you need, right. Okay. Now, when I say what you need, I am not talking about the exam necessarily, what you need in real life, right, okay. Now, I know not <laughs> large number of you will probably not do civil engineering because we, anyway, we can accommodate only a certain number, but you are supposed to have all these broad ideas about how things work, right, okay. So, this is how structures work, trusses in particular, right. So, uh, so three dimensional uh, trusses uh, are, are called, well actually this is this is wrong, no, I mean I just wrote this out by hand, right. So, I have spotted a mistake right at the start. So, can you say space trusses, <laughs> sorry, sorry, they are space trusses, right. My file name says space trusses, but this one I have somehow space. So, it does not mean that it is in outer space. Right. 
right. So, I am contrasting space trusses to plane trusses, right, plane trusses, plane means in one single plane, right. Do not think that plane means an aeroplane and space means a rocket or something like that, no it is not like that, right, okay. Plane means one single plane, uh, space means it is in you know three dimensional space, right. So, now we just looked at a situation that uh, well especially the method of sections, we said three equilibrium equations, right, vertical, horizontal and moment equilibrium. Here you can get six, right. We have looked at that early also even in that beam when we cut right a general bar, right, you have six stress resultants, right. So, six equations of equilibrium for anything that is three dimension, right. So, um, now that means in the x, y and z directions all the forces are equal, in the x, y and z directions all the moments are equal, right. But if we have pinned space trusses which is what we are going to look at, you remember I said truss means only uh, only axial forces, right. Then, uh, so actually maybe this is correct, but just do not worry you put space trusses, right. So, in general for space frames, right, this is correct, but uh, if you have space trusses, then these equations do not apply because the joints cannot carry moment, right, unless you take an equilibrium equation for the entire thing, right. So, so, so we are only dealing with these three, right, okay. So, that makes it a bit easier, right. Now, this is a joint, right. Now, these are the three directions x, y and z. Now, let us say that there is a force T in this member, right. And generally, that is a force we need to find, right. That is a force we need to find. Now, in order to apply these equations, we need the components in the x, y and z directions. So, this is a simple sort of how do we find these components, how do we find these components, right. So, if you think about this y as a vertical component, <coughs> then perpendicular to y will be this horizontal plane. Now, this is inclined at theta to the horizontal plane, right. So, we can first of all find the component of T along this diagonal, right. In other words, what is the component of T in the horizontal direction? Once that horizontal direction need not be x or z. Once you find the horizontal component, in the ho uh, once you find the uh, horizontal component, then you can resolve that horizontal component once again into the x and z direction. So, how, how will it work? So, f x that is the x component of this will be first of all this t cos theta, right, t cos theta that will give you the force in that direction and that one cos alpha. So, t cos theta times cos alpha. So, there will be a double co cos, right, okay. So, if you think about the, the, the lengths that are involved actually, cos theta will be a b sorry a c divided by a b right and cos alpha now this one I have marked x 1 and z 1 at these points right. Uh, so, so that is x 1 divided by a c. So, the a c will cancel and you will get t into x 1 divided by a b right. So, similarly if you go to z this part will be the same first of all you take the horizontal component t cos theta. Now, here if this is alpha, this will be cos 90 minus alpha or sin alpha, right. So, that A c divided by A b will remain the same and here cos of that angle will be z 1 divided by A c, right. So, once again the A c will cancel and you will get T into z 1 divided by A b. Now, if you take the vertical component that will be T sin theta or in other words T cos of 90 minus theta that is the component in that direction, right. So, that angle will in fact be y 1 divided by a b. So, what you can see is that uh, this distance a b is common to all these expressions the value of a b is in fact the square root of x 1 square plus y 1 square plus z 1 square. That is the length of that 
uh, uh, with, with the, the, yeah, the, that is that length, right? Okay. Uh, so, in general, for an element i j, right, uh, the, the x component will be the force in the member times the difference between the x values and the length of the member, right. So, x now here this is x 1 and here we are assuming it to be 0, but in general it will be x j minus x i c, right. And so, 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 so we can write it in short form as f x in is equal to t, right, where this is t divided by L, that is the force divided by the length of the member and here this is the length in the x direction. So, this is, this is, this is length in space, right, this is the length of the member in space. That length of the member will in space will have an x component, y component and z component, the length. Right? Okay. So, the forces in those three directions will be this tension coefficient that is the force divided by the length multiplied by L x L y and L z. Right? So, if you look at some of these textbooks, right, uh, you know sometimes they are written in like vectors. Right? In other words, uh, the, 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 the directions of x and things like that are also important. Right? But I think just when I am just introducing this, you know, maybe for 20 minutes at the end of this uh, topic, right, it is better if you do not worry about this as a vectorial representation. Think of it as a scalar and think of it, well, you have to think of it as a vector in the sense that there are there is direction, but you uh, try to imagine what is actually happening, right. So, that way you will not make a mistake. Otherwise, if you try to mechanically use the the signs of these uh, coordinates like using a strict coordinate geometry solution, then you might be sort of you, you might make mistakes, right. So, let us see whether we can apply this to a simple structure, right. So, so once again the we, we, we are dealing with the simpler structures, right. So, this is in space, right, this is in space. There are this joint D is the free joint others are fixed to foundations, right. So, uh, you can see that this is stable because this is an open three dimensional truss, truss, one free joint connected to fixed points by three members, m equals 3 j is the requirement, right. Now, how do we visualize this? We can visualize it by looking at these coordinates, right. So, these are, let me see now. Uh, the x, y and z coordinates, right. So, you can see that this x coordinate is 0, x coordinate is 0, x coordinate is 0. So, you can see that a, b and c are on the same vertical plane, same vertical plane. Now, here x coordinate becomes 40, that means it is sort of like projecting out of that vertical plane, right. Now, the z is in this direction, right. So, z here is uh, minus 10 and z here is plus 10. So, in the other horizontal, yeah, so, in this, so this is one horizontal direction, it is projecting 40 units this way. These two supports, in fact, are at the same vertical level because this is the y 0 and 0. So, at the same vertical level, right, and they are a certain distance apart, right. In other words, 20 units apart because this is minus 10 and this is plus 10. Now, this one, the z component is 0. So, this one is right in between this one and this one, if you look at it in plan, right, but it is 40 units above them, right. So, how does it look? Well, I do not know whether you have done any of these things, but this is, this is very important that you know it, right. So, if you have a three dimensional structure, you need to be able to visualize, visualize it in what we call elevation and in plan. So, if you look at it from a side, what will you see, right? You will see that here A and B both will be in the same line of sight, right? C will be 40 units above it and this point D will be 40 units horizontally away from it. A and B are on the same line of sight, okay? So, this is 20 units above, this is 20 units above because how do we know that? 
because this is 20, the y coordinate is 20, here the y coordinate is 40, here the y coordinate is 0, right. Now, if you look at it from above, that is in plan, then this one here, this point here is right in between this one and this one, the z coordinate is 0, here is minus 10, here is minus 10 and here also the z coordinate is 0, that is z is in this direction, right. So, in plan you will see that this is connected to this, but actually now this uh, yeah, so, so when you go from C to D, you are coming from a higher elevation to a lower elevation, but if you look down like this you cannot see it, because you are seeing it in plan. Uh, the elements B, D and A, D are going from a lower elevation to a higher elevation, right. Okay. Can everybody visualize this now? So, that is the important thing in three dimensional structures to be able to visualize it, okay. I should have brought a small <laughs> model, but yeah. Yeah, elevation means you are looking at it uh, like, uh, like you are you are looking you are looking at it sideways, sideways, right. Plan means you are looking at it downwards, right. Plan means you are looking at it downwards. Y means the y direction is the up and down direction, y direction is the up and down direction, right. So, everything in the y direction should be seen clearly. Any differences in the y direction, you should be able to see clearly in the elevation any differences in the x and z directions, you should be able to see clearly in the plane, right. So, this is the plane, the x and z are the horizontal dimensions, right, y is the vertical dimension, right, okay. I will let you digest that a bit. Can you picture that? Yeah. So, maybe it is something like this. If I take the bottom two members, what is that called? A D and B D, they are going up like this, right. They are going up like this. <laughs> I do not have another finger, but the other one is coming down like that. One is coming down like this, two are going up like this. That is the way it is looking, right, okay. And it is loaded at D, it is loaded at D vertically downwards, okay. So, the thing is we have to find those forces, force in B D, force in A D, force in C D, right. So, if we use what we know, right, this is the length right. So, the length we get by the difference of the coordinates, right. This is the difference in the x coordinates, this is the difference in the z coordinates, right. Uh, and, and this is the difference, uh, uh, this is the difference in the y coordinates and, and this is the difference in the, 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 the z coordinates, right. Okay. Okay. Right. And similarly, where C D is concerned, this is the difference in the x coordinates, this is the difference in the y coordinates, and this is the difference in the z coordinates, right. Where z coordinate is concerned, there is no difference, you know, because this is the variation of z, so z does not vary, right. So, we can find uh, the, the, the length, uh, the length of this, the length of this, then in each case we can find what the length in the x direction, length in the y direction. So, L x of A d, if you think about this one here, right. So, where A d is concerned, what is the length in the x direction? Length is 40. What is the length in the y direction? So, if you think about A d, the length in the y direction is this vertical difference 20, right. So, that is all we need. So, length in the x direction for C D is similarly 40, length in the y direction for C D is 20, right. Now, 
Now, anyway, if you look at this structure, we will find that T2 and T1, the entire structure is symmetrical uh, about this, right, about CD, right. So, the force in this should be equal to the force in that. So, that is why we have said if we are, if we, if I ask this T1, T2 and T3, T1 and T2 will be identical by symmetry, right. So, we only need to find T1 and T3, wherever we find T2, we can put as T1, right. So, there are two unknowns. So, therefore, two equations are going to be enough horizontal equilibrium at x at d and vertical equilibrium at d, right. So, in this direction, now we are we have marked this as tensile, tensile right. Uh, so, there is 2 T 1, that is 2 T 1 meaning T 1 plus T 2, right, into L x divided by L plus T 3 into L x divided by L for C D, that will be equal to 0. So, that, that, that is why, so we have put F x, F x for C D plus F x for So, f x for B d plus f x for C d plus f x for C d is equal to 0, but th these two are, are the same, right. So, 2 t 1 into this plus t 3 into the same uh, uh, same component here, say same, same uh, ratio here will be equal to 0, right. So, since we know L x and this length and L uh, and, and, and L x and that length for both a, b and c, d, we can get one equation like that, right. So, in the same way, we can do vertical equilibrium here. So, when we do vertical equilibrium, now we have marked this as tensile forces. So, this one is now, this component will be vertically upwards, this component will be vertically downwards, this component will be vertically downwards, right. So, the vertical component of that we balance the vertical components of that plus this 100 kilo Newton load, right. So, that is why we write uh, whatever, is, whatever is acting downwards is 2 T 1 into L by upon L A D plus 100 equals this T 3 which is acting upwards T 3 into the uh, y direction length divided by the total length of C D. That is all the, always the way the equations are written. So, we know L y, we know L for C d, we know L y and we know L by L for A d, right. So, we can write this second equation. So, if we combine both of these equations, then we can find both T 1 and T 3, right. So, this one takes a little bit of visualizing, right, takes a little bit of visualizing, but uh, You, you look at it and you should be able to get your head around it, hopefully, right. Okay, let me take any questions, any immediate questions from this. So, in terms of equilibrium equations, it is just vertical and horizontal equilibrium, right. But the equilibrium equations are written like this sigma f x equals 0, sigma f y equals 0, right. Here we are not using this anyway, right, right. And the expression that you get for f x will be uh, this force times the difference in the coordinate divided by the total length and that will apply to the corresponding member, right. So, we have to find this one and this one for each of those members framing into the joint, right and that will be f x for that member and similarly f y for that member when if there are y coordinates there, right. So, that is why we have uh, found all of these things uh, before we are finding that, right. So, so this is sigma f x equals 0 and this is sigma f y equals 0. Okay. Right. Okay. Now, 
I'm not going to spend any more time on that, right? Okay. Uh, but uh, but yeah, you you can take that that sheet, right? Okay. You can take that sheet and uh, you can uh, so evaluate my lectures, right? Over the last, uh, can, can I have? Is there an extra sheet somewhere? An extra sheet, evaluation sheet. Where are those? Where, where are the leftovers? Please pass those round. Oh, the sheets are still here. Can you please make sure everybody gets one? Yeah. So I think you should not write your name on it first of all, right? You should not write your name on it, right? Can I just see this? Then the way that I interacted with students, the way that I organized myself and how clear I was, right? Okay, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's given. That's given. Two way. Two way, no? Yeah. 